Divine Truth Events. These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Faith and Prayer. Presented by Jesus on the 22nd of June, 2013, in town of Mergen, Queensland, Australia. This is session three, part two. So, so what is the truth about God? God is always loving. That's the truth about God. What do you believe? You don't believe that. You don't believe God's always loving. All right? Many of you don't even believe any of God's, many of God's laws are loving. How many of you still have a trouble with the law of attraction? <laughs> you know that law that brings you events that sometimes feel pretty harsh, right? And you believe that that law is unloving. You believe that your idea of it is better than God's idea of it, in fact. All right? But it's a beautiful law. It tells you every single time you're unloving. Notice I said it tells you every single time you're unloving. That's the purpose of the law. All of the laws are there to help you see where love is not engaged. All of the laws, even the law of gravity, is there to help you see when love is not engaged. Huh? All the physical laws are there for the same purpose as the spiritual laws, for the same purpose as the soul-based laws. They're all there to help you understand one fact, and that is that love is the thing that defines everything. Every one of God's laws is loving, but most of us don't believe that. We don't believe that. That's why you want to break God's laws all the time. Because you don't believe that they're loving. The main difference between myself and most other people is I do not want to break God's laws. Because I know they're all loving. And if I feel they're unloving, I know that there's a problem inside of me, not with God's law. So whenever I feel the law of attraction, for example, is unloving, I know that the problem is inside of me. It's not a problem with God's law, because God's laws are always loving, and I have faith in that. I have faith that God's laws are all loving. The reason why I have that kind of faith is because I've had 2,000 years experiencing them, of course, but I had to bite off that experience. There's plenty of other people who are now living in the hells of the spirit world who have lived just as long as I have and have no trust at all that God's laws are loving. So what causes the difference? Isn't the difference primarily just what we chose to do in that period of time? Yep, if you want to... Is that a question? Um, Mike, where's the mic? So, thanks, thanks. Did you, you keep your hand up for me. So can you see that everything is revolving around this issue of of love. All of God's laws are loving and the majority of us have no faith in that. Yeah, I, I feel that it's um, a question of uh, lack of personal experience. For, um, most people don't experience God or haven't experienced God. True. Um, you know, you've got experience, so you're beyond faith in a way. Yeah, but, but I had to get that experience somehow and I started without having any experience. So I had to do something with the exercise of my will. I had to do something in order to get that experience. And what I'm suggesting to people today is that the majority of us have so much faith in fear that we don't even decide to do something in order to confront and, and create an experience where they eventually come to experience the truth. Yeah. And I feel that's the main problem that we face, is that we are so focused on avoiding the experience because of all of our fears that we end up... And I know, I've know i known many people in my life that have lived for thousands of years who still have had no experience with God because of how they've exercised their will. They exercise their will in harmony with their faith in the fear rather than their faith in the truth. And they've often, many of them have been presented the truth in that time period, but still have a faith in the fear. And in this discussion, what I've tried to illustrate just earlier with the discussion about God and soulmates, is that the majority of us still have faith in our fear. And that causes us to not act, and therefore we don't get experience. Does that make sense? Like, I see the linkage of all of those kinds of things together. So... I feel that for all of us, what we need to do is start exercising 
our will to, to decide to, to act in faith about the reality of the truth about love and about God. <laughs> can you see that all these qualities are sort of... That it's not like you can develop them one at a time. That they, they are all needed to be integrated within you in order for your progress to occur. But unfortunately, the majority of us are not doing that. What we do instead is we have this faith in the fear. We actually believe the false thing is true. So we have faith in the fear, and that causes the fear then modifies our will, where we become out of harmony with love, we become out of harmony with truth, and we have no humility because we're terrified to even feel an emotion. Right? And as a result of that, our faith, although we have a faith, we do have a faith in that state, but our faith is in the things that are false. And for the majority of us still, after hearing divine truth for six years, our faith is not in the things that are true. The faith is still in the things that are false. And at some point in time, we're going to have to make a decision. We're going to have to exercise our will to make a decision. Are we going to continue justifying the fear, the false, to ourselves? Or are we going to be willing to give up the false and start experimenting with experiences in this direction? Now remember earlier I said to you, um, before we began this conversation... Um, I said to you that myself and Mary, we've been thinking, we've had quite a few people from UK wanting us to come to the UK. We don't have any money to go to the UK, and we didn't realise, you know, and most of the people who, who were there that want us to come don't have any money to help us come. And so we were just wondering how this was going to occur. Now, I have some faith in God about things and how things get created. If I engage my will in harmony with God's laws, I know that God can work with things to make things happen that I can't make happen by myself. Right? And our even just having an offer for somebody to, to take us there, somebody in the media who only wants to interview us for 10 minutes, right? well, has now, is now right at this moment considering whether they will take us to England or not to do that interview. They'd prefer that to occur. And we're going, this is very strange. We wanted to go to England, <laughs> but we had no idea how that would occur. But we have some faith in God that if we engage our will, and our will was to share the truth with other people, and in fact I had quite a lot of emails when I started doing that again with the media, in fact, I had people, some of them in this audience, saying to me, why are you engaging the media when the last time it happened, it wasn't very good for you? Right? And the reason why is because I have some faith in God. That's why I engage them. Not because I, I don't believe that they're all going to be the same. But that, that's a false belief. There's no single person on this planet that's the same as another person. So how can I believe that all the media are going to be the same? That doesn't make any logical sense to me. And yet these people who were emailing these emails to me were telling me that all the media is the same. And I'm going, okay, that's your false belief. It's not mine. I don't believe that. It's a bit like you saying, and many of you ladies have done this, I've had five bad relationships with men. Men are all bastards. Now, is that a logical extension? No, it's not. Right? You see, we often make very illogical extensions because we're living in our fear. Faith is logical. Faith goes, it's impossible for everyone to be the same. We know that for certain. It's impossible for everyone to be the same. We have a direct, in our day-to-day -day life, 
How many of you have had children? Yes? Just put up your hand if you had children. Okay. Now, how many of your children were exactly the same? Aren't a lot of them like night and day? Totally different. They, come, they were brought up in the same family and yet they're not the same. All right? So if, if two children in a family are not the same, how can all the media be the same? Doesn't make any sense, does it? You have direct proof in your own life, you have enough proof to, to satisfy your faith that each person is an individual with, with its own personality. And yet you don't apply that to things you're afraid of. Can you see how we just have faith in the error and we don't have faith in the truth? This is what we do. We manipulate the truth because of our fear. Our fear is dictating to us what we are choosing to believe in. So you, while you have come, many of you have come for years listening to what we have talked to you about called the divine truth. But many of you still don't think it's the divine truth. You think it's the truth according to AJ. Huh? And to be honest with you, you're going to continue thinking that until you try some experiments until you try developing these qualities in harmony with them each other rather than in harmony with your fear until you try that in your day-to-day -day life you will not know anything that I'm talking to you about whether it's true or not it'll just sound to you like it's a great idea or a utopian dream right? But it, but it won't be, be reality until you go through the process. And, and again, that's your choice. That's the exercise of your will. Nobody else can do that for you. Nobody else can control that for you. So, you know what I feel happens for many of us? Whenever we have our fear in play... It's like we have this whole set of belief structures around this fear that support our fear. And as a result of that, we don't believe most of the things we hear. We just don't. We don't truly believe them. Now let's get back to the soulmate issue. Most of us don't truly believe in it. We like the concept. We think it's a nice idea. You know, having someone who's your ideal, perfect partner for the rest of your life. You know, that's the things dreams are made of, right? That's the whole thing that, you know, the Disney cartoons are all based around. We have so much cynicism about it. And this cynicism is driven by our fear. Right? We don't believe in it. And you're not going to believe in it, no matter what I say. Until you go through some experiments and, and see how to attract your soulmate. What actually happens when you meet your soulmate? What's going on? What kind of person they are? All those kind of things you'll never know until you try the experiments. You won't know otherwise. And no amount of talking about it will help you unless you're willing to have some faith and use your will in harmony with love, truth and humility. Unless you're willing to do that, nothing will change. And so, you know, we'll be, I'll be asking in 10 years' time, who's met their soulmate? And there'll be one or two people put up their hands, perhaps. And then in 100 years' time, I'll say, we'll be up in the spirit world, maybe. And we'll have a meeting like this, and you go, who's met your soulmate? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's still, it's still right, still a problem. <laughs> right. And then a thousand years' time, we go, who's met your soulmate? <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's no such thing as soulmates. I have never met mine in a thousand years. And of course you're not going to unless you have some faith and go through some experiments as we've described, faith describes, prescribes. Faith demands that we experiment, that we go through some different things. And if we use our will in harmony with love, truth and humility, we won't damage anybody, we won't harm anybody around us when we do this. We won't choose to be immoral, we won't choose to be unethical. 
We will do every choice, we'll make every choice and decision in harmony with morals and ethics while we're discovering the truth about the issue of our soulmate. That's what we would do. And the only reason why we're not doing it is because we're afraid. We're afraid that our little life that we have now might get upset. And some of, for some of you, you like being alone, right? You've got total control over your life. You love that, right? Yeah. For some of you, you like having your partner that you can totally manipulate and control. Oh, yeah. He, doesn't have, he or she is not scaring you and making your life nice and comfortable. Everything's fine. Right? You like that. You don't want someone to come along who challenges every single thing inside of you. You want somebody just like that. And that person might even be your soulmate, but he's not allowed to be the person, or she is not allowed to be the person that you have not prescribed for them to be. And that's not very kind. That's out of harmony with love and truth and humility. But we choose it because we're uh, afraid. Right? For many of us, when it comes to the soulmate issue, we're afraid of what everyone else will talk, say about us. Right? We're afraid of what people will think when we discover our soulmate. We're afraid of what our children will say, what our parents will say, what our family will say, what our friends will say. Right? Pretty much afraid of everything, if we come to think of it, aren't we? On that one issue. Right? Half the time we're afraid that we're not soulmates. The other half the time we're afraid we are. <laughs> right? And we don't give up our fear because we have complete faith in it. We don't have any faith in God's truth, God's love, humility. We don't have any faith that if we use our will in harmony with those three things, that everything will get sorted out perfectly. Everything. We don't have any faith in that. And it's sad, you know, because I've seen, you know, the, I suppose you could say the one advantage of 2,000 years of existence is you get to meet a lot of people. And as a result, you get to see patterns in people. How fear drives their day-to-day -day actions, for example, becomes a, a very obvious pattern with people. Many of the people that myself and Mary know from 2,000 years ago are sti still have not met their soulmates. And we find that pretty sad, that after 2,000 years, a person could not meet their soulmate. In fact, I've met people in the spirit world that after 30,000 years in the spirit world, they still haven't met their soulmate. Now, why do some meet their soulmate within five years of hearing about the whole concept of having one, and then others not meet them in 30,000 years? The only reason why is because they have exercised their faith in the error. Yeah. They've used their will in harmony with fear. That's all they've done. For whatever reasons. But even worse than that, I find, is the issues people have with God. Because right? it's the issues people have with God that have the most severe effect on their life. And it's the issues people have with God that we usually have the most fear surrounding. And as a result, we have a tendency to use our will completely out of harmony with any faith. And yet the entire divine truth presentations are all about developing a relationship with God. And the benefits of doing so. Remember a few years ago now, it would have been... I I think it was in 2011, but I'm not certain. It might have been last year. Things go past quite fast nowadays. Um, I gave a talk about the eternal benefits of the relationship with God. It was at Bathurst, if you ever want to look at it. I gave that talk because I could see that the majority of people have no idea what they're giving up by not having a relationship with God. They have no idea what they're giving up. So why, why I raise this issue under this talk, topic is that if my faith is in my fear and if my faith is in the errors that I now believe are true, so remember fear is all about error, it's all about what's false. If my faith 
is surrounding what is false, I will not use my will in harmony with what is true. Can you see that? If I believe and have faith in the false, it is very unlikely that I am going to use my will in harmony with the truth. I am probably going to use my will in harmony with the false. And this is why the majority of us do that. We use our will in harmony with the false. And we could come up with millions of examples in our day-to-day -day life, but what I was thinking of is a great exercise for yourself in this particular thing. So if you take one thing away from our first part of our discussion today, it's this. Note down all the ways that you can see yourself using your will in harmony with what is false from God's perspective. You could even do it this way if you don't have much of a belief in what is true. You could even say every way in which you use your will in harmony with what AJ has presented to you, what Jesus has presented to you, or out of harmony with what I've presented to you. I'm not asking you to believe what I've presented to you. I'm just asking you to see where you use your will out of harmony with it. Does that make sense to you? I'm not saying to you you have to believe everything that I say. What I'm suggesting is that you use your will, your free will, to determine when what you do is out of harmony with what's being said to you. So, for example, I'm telling you that God is love. Now, in the course of a day, ask yourself the question, what in my actions today prove that I believe that and that I am exercising my will in harmony with that? I've also said that God is truth. So how am I using my will today in harmony with that basic principle? Or out of harmony with it? Does that make sense? If you ask yourself that question, you'll find a lot about yourself and how much your faith is based on what's false. Um, if we go to Rachel and then to Mary and then to... Ra to Teresa. So uh, Mary's already got the mic, so just to Teresa and Rachel, thanks. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question or a statement or a confrontation, or I'm not really sure, but I just wanted to address something that you said before about only people that don't feel their feelings end up in mental institutions. And I've ended up in a mental institution, <laughs> I believe, from f being, from feeling my feelings, actually, and I didn't know what was happening at that time and I didn't believe in the process that I knew was on some level I knew was happening but I just didn't trust myself enough to kind of stand up for the, the no, you know knowing what I was going through basically and so I, so why did you end up in the institution because I believed that everybody else knew better than I did that that and I just kind of went along with that's where I needed to be, this process that I was going and through. And I would argue that's not feeling your feelings. See, yeah. it's like when you truly feel your feelings, you know that only you can feel your feelings better than anyone else. So you would never trust anybody else's assessment of your own feelings. Yeah, I don't know if it was so much trusting them as just... Why did you finish up involving them? Well, I, I didn't involve them, I just... No, but how did they become involved? They were there and imposed their will on, upon me in terms of that was what... But if you, did, if you did it in harmony with love, they wouldn't have been there. What do you mean if I did it in harmony with love? Well, I don't feel my negative emotions in, in front of you all the time. No, for me it was a spontaneous thing that I just went into terror and was, you know, terror was moving through... Through me, your body, just, yep. yeah. Yeah, absolutely, like waves and waves of terror. Yep. And it was, you know, and I knew that if I, I felt like I could stop that process, but why would I? Because it was that... Well, if you were loving, you would have stopped it and went home and felt it then. Right. I, I was at home, but other people were there, and I think it triggered their fear. That was my of course. experience. And that their fear dictated that I kind of, yeah, went 
You've just told him I... Sorry, probably. that I went into a, you know... Um, I agree. But that's them also not feeling their feelings. If everyone around you had felt their feelings and you felt yours, nothing like ending up in a mental institution could have occurred. Yeah, I know. I guess partly why... If I you hold to... the mic straight Sorry. to you. So. Partly why I wanted to share was because I guess that was a really big fear that I had inside of me, that if I felt all of my emotions that I... I mean, not consciously then, but now I realise, looking back, past done from through my family, that if I felt my fear that that's where I would end up, which is ironically kind of what happened, but by me feeling And I'm my suggesting fear, that's why it happened. Yeah, right. Because you weren't feeling the fear. You weren't feeling the fear of it happening. And that's why it happened. You see, you're feeling one set of emotions, but not the emotion that caused you to end up in the, mental, right. in the institution. Right, I hear what you're saying, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what I'm saying to you. Every single time you feel all of your emotions, you won't end up anywhere other than where you are right now. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Because nobody will, around you will do anything to you, treat, treat you badly. You'll have no fears because you'll be feeling them. You'll have no fears projected out onto the world around you. Yeah, Nothing right. like that could happen. Yeah, okay. You can't attract anything under those points. That's the law. Yeah. I, I know God's laws well enough to know yeah. that's the law. I hear what you're saying. So the only thing I wasn't feeling was that fear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's that fear that lobbed you where you ended up. Yeah, right. Okay, Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. And, and often this is what happens is we start attrib we, we have these false beliefs because we look at events that have happened in our life and we attribute them to something that, that wasn't their cause. All right? so, so your experiencing terror about another issue was not the cause of you lobbying in, your, lobbying in the mental institution. Yeah, the cause was right. your fear of having to go to a mental institution. Right. That's the cause. Right. Do you understand? Totally and what we finish up doing is we make these false assumptions, which are fear-based assumptions, not understanding the power of their creation. All right? So what I, I still feel that what I said was exactly accurate. Yeah, that's if all of us feel every single emotion and are humble to every single emotion at every single time, none of us will end up in a mental institution. And none of us will end up psychotic. None of us will end up with manic depression or depression or, or schizophrenia or any other mental illness whatsoever because it's impossible to. All of these things are only possible when we deny emotion. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Yep. But you don't have a faith in that yet, Rachel. Yeah. If we come down. Thanks, Kate. I just um, am a bit confused about the question. Um, what my actions prove that I believe that God is love, God is truth. Just about if you would have any examples about that reflection. Sure. Um, so, if I have faith in the fear, let's. So, what, what do you like doing in the course of a day? Oh, something creative like music or okay. art. So, music, art, and uh, you, you, you're with your soulmate. No. No. So, not with your soulmate. So, you're alone doing these things. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. And how does that feel? Oh, it feels all right. Feels all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you're okay with that. It feels fantastic. You're really happy with that. I get to control it all, which okay, is really okay. nice. Okay. So now, now we're I quite, talking. I quite like that. <laughs> you quite like the control that that gives you? Yeah, I'm addicted to the control. I love it. Okay. Yeah, you love it. Okay. So you feel you're addicted to the control. Now you're being honest. See, that's great, Kate. Addicted. Now. If we had faith in the truth, would we honour our addiction? If we had faith in truth? Yeah, if you had faith in the truth, would you honour any addiction you have right now? Because what have you learnt about addictions? It's, it's avo avoidance of, of? My, my soul, like growing my soul. No, it's avoidance of fear. Okay. This is what we've learnt, isn't it? Sure, yeah. Uh, three and a half years ago, actually, if you were with me three and a half years ago, you would have learned that, right? So, addictions are there to help you look after your fears. You agree? This is why you want control, 
because you're afraid of something. What are you afraid of? Um, Let's say your soulmate control. comes along. What is he going to do to your life? Your soulmate? Yeah. Oh, the things we listed, like not having control and not liking me, me not liking him. Yep. Um, so all of those things are true from God's perspective? No, fear. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Write down these things that you notice you're doing in the day-to-day -day life. So you're addicted to, to control, right? You, you acknowledge yes. that. Yes. But, but, but you're justifying it to yourself at the moment. You're saying, I should be addicted to control. That's good for me. My life's good like this, right? This is what you're saying to yourself. Yeah. That's faith in the error. Okay. Your life's not good like this, Kate. Not really. No. Oh, it could be a lot better. <laughs> it could be a lot better. Imagine for a moment a relationship where they want you to do everything you want to do and they'll love you while you do it. And you want them to do everything they want, you, they want to do and you love them while they do it. Now, that would be a pretty beautiful relationship, wouldn't it? Yeah. And already some sadness comes up, even me saying it. Right? But it's the, that sadness you're avoiding. That's what the fear is covering, you see. And this is the beauty of doing this exercise, is by doing the exercise you go, yes, in the day to day, this is what I like. I like my addictions being met. I still like that. And you're justifying it to yourself. You've got to see that you're justifying it to yourself. Because that's having faith in the error. That's having faith in your fear. That's having faith in the error. It's faith in your error that causes you to tell yourself that everything's great when you're addicted to control. And from God's perspective, everything's not great. God's going, Kate, 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 nothing's great. You're addicted to control. That's what God's trying to do with you. And you're going, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, this is good. This is good. I've got control. It's fantastic. Right? And God's shaking you, saying, like, with all of the law of attraction, remember, all of God's laws are focused in bringing you to the point of truth. So God's, through the law of attraction, showing you this addiction to control is actually a faith in a fear. And, and you're justifying it to yourself. You're justifying this addiction to control. You think it's good. And God's saying, no, no, it's not the way I created you to be. It's not the way. I created you to be. I created you to be this free individual who's able to receive and give love without having to control. That's what I created you to be. And you're going, no, 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 I don't want that. I want my addiction to control. Subsequently, you are alone. You, in fact, have created being alone because of this addiction to control. Because if somebody is with you, you lose control. Mm. And, and so it's better for you, you think, mm. to be alone. So you are willing to accept the compensation, the penalty, for the addiction. Which is faith in a fear. It's faith in the error. Do you see how it works? Yeah, it's a bit. It's still... Like, I haven't seen this before, so it's a bit... Yeah. I'm a bit confused, but I, yeah, I can see. You see, and, and if a lot of us looked at our day-to-day -day life, we would see that we have physical addictions, we have emotional addictions. And the physical and emotional addictions are covering over fears. Fears that we have faith in. Fears that we believe are true. We believe they're true. You believe that when a man comes into your life, you'll have to do everything he wants. You believe that? Do I? Okay. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> you believe me. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yep. So, you, so you're suggesting... Well, uh, otherwise you would allow a man into your life and then confront that emotion, wouldn't you? Sorry? If you really wanted to not be alone, you would do that. Allow a man into my life? You would allow a man into your life and let him confront this emotion. So how do, how do I do that, though? Because I, I, I need by to work through some faith, the soulmate issues. By having some faith in the truth. You, don't, you see, what I, I think what I need to do is go, go back a little. Because in the future, in probably uh, August, I'm going to give a talk about the integration of the five primary qualities that you need to develop. What do you think they are? 
<laughs> ah, yes, 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 those ones. Those ones there, right? We're going to talk about the integration of them. How to put it all together, like in terms of your day-to-day -day life. Does it make sense? That'll be the discussion I have with you on August the 10th. Now, what I'm trying to do now is introduce you to the concept that the majority of us are not putting things together in our life because we are using our will to retain faith in what we're afraid of or retain faith in the error. That's what we're doing. So, for example, in your, in your personal circumstance, you know you're addicted to control. Is this a truth or an error from God's perspective? Is control good? Error. Right, that's an error from God's perspective, but you're telling yourself that it's good. I, I value it, so I must think it's good. Of course you do. I maintain it and value it. So Your whole day, today life is planning it out so that you have it. So you definitely think it's good. Okay. And what I'm saying to you is, you believe that, which is an error based on fear, you believe it's good. And God's saying, okay, this is not good. This is not how I created you to be. But you're going to God... F you, <laughs> I believe this is good. And I'm going to hold on to that no matter what. I'm going to hold on to that no matter how alone I get, no matter how hard my life gets, no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to hold on to that because it's good. And that, to me, is a stubbornness to retain the faith in the error. And what I'm noticing is the majority of people don't change because they are stubbornly holding on to the error. They don't want to give it up. So we can, it's one thing for me to be told intellectually that control, being addicted to control is a problem. Right? I can be told it, but inside of myself, if I love control, it's going to be pretty hard for me to believe it. And while I love control, I am loving the error. Remember, if I just rub this fear out for a moment, and I just call it instead, error. I know that addic being addicted to control is an error. It creates all sorts of negative things in my life. Historically, it probably has already. Right? It creates all negative things. But I have faith in it. I want to retain this error. I am stubbornly holding on to this error. I'm stubbornly saying that somehow my life's going to get better as long as I get more control. And yet the control of the past hasn't made your life better. So, and it certainly hasn't attracted your other half. And it certainly hasn't got you closer to God. And it certainly hasn't made you more happier. And in fact, when you've let go of control, you've often had events happen then that have made you happier. And we have all this feedback going on, and yet we still hold on to control. And you know what I call that? Stubborn. We're just stubborn. It's like we just we we, we want to just stay there and go. <laughs> like basically, most of us are doing that. It's like we're having this controlled tantrum with God. Like God's got all of this, all of these qualities are all there. God's saying, look, you embrace all of these things, and your life is going to be like unimaginably happy. You you have no idea, no concept at this point. God's saying of how happy you're going to be if you become like I created you to be. And you're going... <clears throat> right? Like with the growling, because, because you think that if you become how God created you to be, that somehow you're going to you have some other fears. Like that, that means you're giving up your own will, that you're not going to be able to do what you enjoy, and you, all these other things. There's all these false beliefs that are inside of us that cause us to hold on to this fear. And what I'm suggesting to you is that while that's happening, it is impossible to engage any progress with these qualities. 
Does everyone get that? It's impossible to engage progress with any of these qualities while that is happening. Yeah? If we go out the back. Uh... Um, I can relate to Kate strongly on this one. Yeah. Um, By well, the way, who can relate to Kate strongly on this one? <laughs> yeah, pretty much everyone's with you, Kate. So. <laughs> And so, obviously, the... Who can relate to me on this one? Mm. <laughs> okay. I get it. <laughs> Far away. And I guess if we're not being truthful about that, we can process this whole loneliness, I'm alone and I'm lonely, which is not the real emotion, because it's more about why am I afraid to let a man into my life? Why am I afraid to love? Yes. And really? so... Again, it just highlights if we're not willing to be truthful. So I would call this, if you're feeling this emotion, I would call that an emotion of self-deception. Yes. And remember, I've talked to you about those in a talk that I gave in 2009. Right? Emotions of self-deception. Most of us feel a lot of these emotions of self-deception, not understanding that all of these emotions are created through us having faith in the error. So again, it just really pays to write down God's truth, as you've said in the past. As I've said in the past. What I've done, um, as Mary knows, I've had like hundreds and hundreds of pages of God's truth, AJ's truth, God's truth, AJ's truth. And I, I, I look at God's truth, I write down the truths that I believe are God's truths based on logic and what I believe God to be. And I write down those truths. Boom, 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 boom. And like I've said, I've filled up hundreds of pages like this. Like, this is a part of me getting to know me and getting to know all the flaws that I have that I need to remove from myself, right? So it's very important for the rest of my life. So, of course, I did it and, engaged and still engage this process. So I write down God's truth. God's truth is that no matter what my partner does, I would still be able to love her if I truly loved that's God's truth. My truth is, yeah, when they lied and cheated and stole from me and did all these other things on me, I didn't love them after that. That was my truth. So then I had to go, okay, I'm out of harmony with God's truth on this matter. I expect my partner to not lie, to not steal, to not cheat, to not have sexual relations with somebody else. I expect all of that to happen. And when that doesn't happen, I get sad and I get depressed and I get feel all these other feelings, of course, which are all the results, self-deception emotions, because I will not come to the face the truth. Emotionally, I won't come to face the truth. And as a result, I had to see that I, a lot of my pain was a direct result of my own refusal to accept the truth. My own faith in the error. That wasn't a question, though. What, you have a question? No? You could feel I had a question just then. It seems so, yeah. <laughs> you, you can relate to Kate. If you think about the, your feelings for Kate, and the feeling is basically, you want to hold on to certain things, yes? Yeah. Yeah. That's stubborn. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to realise that I am. Yeah. yeah. Now, can you hope to have more happiness in your life while you're holding on to errors that don't result in love or truth? Can no. you hope to have happiness? No. So what do you do? You accept unhappiness. Mm. You say, as Kate said, I'm okay. Yeah, I've justified that to myself for most yeah. of my life. Yeah. I'm okay. Things are not like outstandingly, excessively happy, but yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. And God's saying... Why are you wanting to just sit with that? Why, why don't you want to have an outstandingly happy and beautiful life? Yeah. Why are you accepting mediocrity? Why do you accept mediocrity in yourself? Because you are afraid. Yeah. And you have faith in the error. Mm. Yeah. And it's also what you said before, like some good things are starting to happen in my life. I'm going, oh, that's spirit influence. That's, you know, when good things start to happen, I start to question going, it's like I'm not willing to receive God's gifts as well. Well, a lot of times when good things start to happen, they can be manipulated by other people. But if you had a faith in your relationship with God and a will to find out the truth, you would eventually find out what was really going on. 
you'd eventually find out whether somebody was manipulating these events behind the scenes or whether it was actually something your soul created. And I guess you've got to pray about the truth to find out. Yeah, most of the time we don't want to know. When something good happens in our life, we just go, I'm just so grateful something good happened in my life. I don't want to know where it came from yeah. or what created yeah. it. I just want to enjoy it. Yeah. We don't even want to know the truth when something good happens, let alone when something bad happens. Mm. Right? We want to believe certain things. And it's our want to believe certain things, which is our faith in error. We, we just want to have certain things happen in our life. And it doesn't often matter to us whether it's out of harmony with ethics, out of harmony with morality, out of harmony with love, out of harmony with truth, out of harmony with all of the principles that we're learning about, the, exercise, the loving exercise of our will. Often we don't care. Let's be honest with ourselves. Often we don't care. Right? When, when your partner says something to you that you find offensive, do you find that the feeling of love just wells up inside of you <laughs> for them? Or do you find instead that the faith in the error is I should be able to defend myself and attack them in response and you give them as much as you got? Is that what happens instead? That's the faith in the error. See, if you had faith in the truth, if you had faith in love, you wouldn't do that. Do you understand? You wouldn't do it. You'd do something different instead. You'd do something in harmony with love instead. The majority of us have large amounts of faith in the error. And we are stubbornly holding on to it. We are, as I said, going internally. It's like... And let yourself really feel it inside of you. It's not just like me acting. It's like... It's angry inside of us so much that we just want to hold on to our error-based positions. How, how many of us would ever accept that it's okay, we would still love our partner if our partner cheated on us? How many of us would really feel that? Like if we truly loved, that's what it would be the truth. We would treat them nicely, we would treat them in truth, we'd be humble to our own emotions as a result of it, we would use our will to help them look at the issue, we would never try to run away from the issue or avoid it, this is how we would be if we, were at one, if we were at one with God, or at least even at one with these emotions. Most of us wouldn't feel that. If we're honest with ourselves, and we need to be honest with ourselves, most of us would see that there's just a long list of things that we have that we could put on the side of God's beliefs, our beliefs, God's beliefs. And the two of them have such a wide gap when we start that, that we would ever wonder how we we're ever going to have God's belief in the end. Now, without doing that process, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to ever become at one with God. The reason why I've recommended many of these processes to you is because they are processes I've had to follow in order to get closer to God. All right? Without doing them, you're going to just keep justifying the error to yourself. Justifying the error to yourself. At some point in your future, you're going to have to say, enough's enough. I've got to stop justifying the error and I've got to see my own unwillingness to actually accept God's truth, whatever that truth is. Right? Let's look at the truth of my life. My life is like I'm happy being alone. That's the truth of my life. I love being alone. I've got total autonomy. I don't have to answer to anybody. It's fantastic. Right? And there's a truth that you, about your condition. But the question is, why do I love being alone when God created me to be one half of somebody else? So I'd say, well, God's idea is soulmates. My idea is I love being alone. You see? And then what I'd go is, okay, if I love being alone, there's got to be reasons. There's got to be reasons that are all out of harmony with love. Because if God created something and I don't want to be become that thing, then it tells me that I'm just being stubborn, rebellious, and I obviously believe my 
ideas are better than God's. Now, you're allowed to do that, but the reality is you'll never become at one with God. So don't fool yourself on that issue. <laughs> and this is why, actually, a lot of people choose to not follow divine love, path. But most people choose to not follow God's way because their own way, they feel, is better. And the, the sixth dimension in the spirit world is full of spirits who still believe, no matter how much they've heard of divine truth, just like many of you, they still believe their own way is better. <laughs> and that's why most of us are still on the natural love path, shall we call it. It's because we still believe our way is better. We still believe it. Even now, five years. You've heard, many of you have heard truth five years. And even now we still believe that our own way is better. <laughs> now, some of you justify to yourself this way. You go, AJ is saying that it's God's truth. Right? But I don't believe that. I believe it's just AJ's truth. AJ is saying that he's Jesus. But I don't believe that either. He said, he's AJ, right? And it's all just AJ's truth. And many of you right now have heard this stuff for five years and still feel that. That's why you haven't even bothered engaging it. You haven't even bothered determining whether it's God's truth or not for yourself. But for some reason you still feel attracted to come. Why is that? There's got to be something going on for you to still come even though you feel that it's just my truth. Now, I'm saying to you it's God's truth, but you believe that. This is a great way for you to avoid a lot of things. You see? Can you see why you believe it's my truth and not God's? You then get to have faith in your errors. And you won't give them up until you believe something different. Yeah. If you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, until recently, um, God's been in the too hard basket. And when I started, when it got too hard, I thought. So, right. so you're saying God was in the too hard basket? Yeah. Okay. I did the rest of it, and I thought I'll leave God until... Till last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I decided it was too hard doing it that way. Yeah. Um, and to me, I don't think I've received God's love. I, I can't sincerely ask for it. Exactly. Yeah. I ask, but it's not sincere. Yeah. Um, but I have experimented with other things, and I feel like... There are times when God has really helped me. Yes. Um, this is I, the beautiful thing about God, huh? When I've sincerely asked. Mm -hmm. And that's shown me when I've been sincere and when I haven't. Yes. Um, the thing is, I'll, I'll do a particular issue and I'll be sincere in my longing to be humble about it and I'll ask God and God has helped me in ways that I didn't think was possible. Yeah. And, but then the thing is, I get to the next issue and I'm starting from scratch again. Yeah. And I don't understand that. I don't, I don't understand why the previous experiences haven't led to more faith the next, when I hit the next issue. Yeah, it's a very good question. And, the reality is because the, you have not dealt with some specific issues which would enable things to be a lot smoother. So, so, for example, what I see a lot of people doing is they do this thing that you've done, and that is put God in the too hard basket. So God then becomes down here, right, in our priority list. And then what usually comes first is self... Shall we call it self-help? Or self-progress, you know, progress of self. All right. Now, 
if God's down there and self-help's up there, can you see an issue with what I've been teaching in all that? Because basically that's what you've done. You've put the, you want to progress. You've put, you know, that's really good. You've developed a desire to progress. You've developed a desire to have some humility, desire for some truth about yourself, a desire to become more loving. You're starting to develop that. And this is all to do with self-help. Yes? Yeah. You've asked God to help you with your self-help. Yeah, basically. Yeah. But, but God is not your focus. God is in your too hard basket. Thought he was moving out of there, but you're going to tell me that Elvira is not really true, aren't you? Sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd started to move in, like I know I'm in the like very baby. On part God, you mean? It. Yeah. I agree. You have, you have, because you've started by th going through this self-help process. You started asking God for help, and then when you asked, you found out that you received some, and as a result of receiving some, that has built some faith in a different direction. Not in the error so much now. You've got some faith of the truth about God. That whenever you ask for help, God always tries to give you some. Right? So there, you've developed some faith in God through this process. I agree. But in the end, if God is not our highest priority, then all of what we're doing is self-reliance. And self-reliance is hard. It's very exhausting. Very exhausting, yes. This is why most people give it up. In the sense of they, they, they give up the process of helping themselves. Because they feel it's too hard to help themselves when they're doing it all alone. It's an exhausting process. It's the process that most people in the spirit world follow. That's the natural love path. The way that most people follow. What I've been suggesting to you is if you focus first on all of the, what did you say they were? Two hard issues about God, right? Then everything would become much easier and simpler. But you haven't wanted to do that. And you've got to ask yourself why. That's my suggestion, is ask yourself why. Because you've learnt enough about God now to know that God's trustworthy, that God obviously cares about you, God wants to help you. Whenever you've asked for help, you've received it from God. So you've learned enough about God by now to know these things. But still God is in the too hard basket. So there's got to be a reason why. And if you deal with that reason, then God can be in the topmost position in terms of priority. And as soon as that happens, everything processing will become much easier. So before when... Um Somebody said that um, it was spirits organising good things for me. Like that, I go into fear then thinking, oh, my law of attraction's changed and oh, wow, I got help. And I think, oh, is it some type of spirit? Sort of, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Yeah. Why not just have some faith that it is God? <laughs> well, I did at the time, but then I got scared. When... And then you get scared yeah. because of a suggestion from someone else. What does that tell you? No, my faith isn't real. Well, no, I, I don't feel so. I think you've got to... You see, remember, faith is a growing thing. Your faith is not big enough yet to overcome the negative opinions of another person. So in other words, while you're alone, you believe in God enough to know that God has helped you. But as soon as you're with somebody who tells you that it wasn't God, it was a spirit, you then start having fear that it wasn't God. So that tells me that you're afraid of other people's opinions and you let other people's opinions modify your own experience. Why do you do that? Because you're afraid of what they think of you. You're afraid of what will happen if you don't do that. There's just a different fear. Does that make sense? So you have some faith in God. And many of you, I agree, have developed some faith in God. It is yet isn't at the top of your priority list. That's the issue you face. That's why it is hard. That's why the emotional work is hard. The emotional work would be much easier if you had God helping you every step of the way. But to do that, you're going to need to have a relationship with God. So in the first century, I decided that my relationship with God was the very first priority of what I had to address and deal with. 
Just before the break, shall I read you something from this book that I'm writing? The first point I'm raising is, does God exist? To me, this was the first fact I needed to establish before I attempted to discover anything else about God. The question as to whether God exists was so important to me that I spent the first 18 years of my life in the first century resolving this question. I felt then, and still feel, that it is pointless generating theories about God's nature when the basic fact of God's existence has not been established. During my life, I have found that God has been consistently demonstrating to me the facts surrounding the truth that God exists, the constant presence of intelligence in the world and the universe surrounding me provided supporting evidence, the complex multi-purpose design and symbiotic relationship between all living things gave further confirmation, the design of the human being and the human's capabilities to feel and love indicate supreme intelligence and care from a designer. I began with a single theory and then I set out to establish for myself whether it was true or not. The theory was, if God exists and God was the mastermind behind all of the creation I could see, then I am a child of God's creation. And if God loved, then surely God would want to share God's love with me and share all of his or her knowledge with me. That was my first theory. When I was very young, I decided that I would develop a desire to receive God's love and truth. And if I did actually receive it, I would then know whether God existed. So began my first experiment. What I found was this. That every time I sincerely had a feeling-based desire to receive love from God, that love would come into me from outside of me with such emotional force that I was overwhelmed emotionally and transformed by the experience every time. I called this sincere feeling-based longing and desire towards God prayer. I came to feel and think very differently to those surrounding me. I also found that each time this happened, I automatically understood more about the universe that I lived in. In other words, I found that I knew more absolute truth automatically. God, through this experience, convinced me of God's existence. Although I did not know when I began whether God existed, I now know the certainty of God's existence, not from supposition nor from inference, but rather from having this continuously growing personal relationship and experience with God. Thus came to me the fundamental truth, God exists. While undertaking my experiment with prayer, I discovered three more simple, fundamental, universally important, deeply moving and life-changing facts. Firstly, I found that each time I prayed, if I felt something about myself that I believed was true, but was not true from God's perspective, God's love would not come to me. I found through this experience that God was telling me the truth about myself. And I needed to develop the quality of humility in order to accept what God was telling me rather than holding on to my own definition of myself. Secondly, and even more importantly, I found that each time I prayed, if I felt something about God that I believed was true but was not true from God's perspective, God's love would not come to me. I found through this experience that God was telling me the truth about God. And if I was going to continue to receive God's love, I needed to accept what God was telling me about him or herself, rather than holding on to my own definition of God. See, many of you are still not giving up your own definitions of God, your own definitions of yourself. Thirdly, I found that each time I prayed, if I felt something about any subject whatsoever that I believed was true, but was not true from God's perspective, God's love would not come to me. I found through this experience that God was telling me the truth about the universe in which I lived. I needed to accept what God was telling me about the universe rather than holding on to my own definition of the universe. And if I did this, I would come to enjoy my own experience of the universe in a deeper and more fulfilling manner. I could also now see with overwhelming wonder how God communicated with me and informed me. It was not with a voice that I could hear. 
but through the feeling of love that I could feel. Thus I understood another fundamental truth. God communicates with all of God's children through the transmission of love. If I was close to love, either its expression or its reception, God could not communicate with me. In addition, every time I felt something out of harmony with God's absolute truth, I could not receive God's love. Even if I thought I still had a feeling-based longing and desire to receive it. I knew that love was there since I had previously felt it, but I just could not receive it in the moment. I could not feel it enter me. I realized that this is how most people live throughout all of their life, not feeling God's love enter them, not knowing what the truth is. I came to see that my own sincere feeling-based longing or desire for God's love, in harmony with God's truth about myself and the universe in which I lived, created an attraction between myself and God. And God, under those conditions, established a conduit between God and myself. And God's love then flowed through this conduit into me. I called this conduit that I eventually came to see with my own eyes the Holy Spirit. So do you understand what I'm saying there about God's love? You see, if we're not open to love and we're not open to either giving it or receiving it, then we can't communicate with God. Because the only way God communicates that I've discovered so far has been through the feeling of love. Right? You could call love the language of God. Now, love, I'm not suggesting to you love is a, is a figment of somebody's imagination or anything like that. What I'm suggesting is it's a feeling that gets transmitted from God to you. And that feeling has certain characteristics and attributes. And one of the attributes is when you're out of harmony with truth, it can't be transmitted. It can't be received by you. It can't enter you. If you can understand the fundamental truth that God communicates not with a voice, but God communicates with the feeling of love, and that for you to actually ever be able to hear God, you're going to have to open yourself up to love, to firstly feeling love inside of yourself and expressing love out towards others from inside of yourself. In other words, open to the reception and transmission of love. Then it's impossible for you to ever have communication with God. You can hear words, but they'll only be words from spirits who might be either good or evil, you don't know. It's only when you can feel the feeling of love that you'll know whether they are even good or bad. So it's through this transmission of love. And without this transmission of love, like none of these qualities, the other qualities that I've mentioned there, can ever be developed. So what I, would, what I feel personally is that if, in, in summary, is if we have any hope of developing in love in our future, if we are to have any hope to do that, we must recognize that faith in errors and using our will in harmony with the error is never going to lead us to love. Never. So the, the reality is you can have faith in things that completely harm and even potentially severely harm in a negative way, painful, with pain and suffering, your life. The reality is the majority of us on this planet are putting our faith in things that harm our lives. And we justify it. We hold on stubbornly to the opinion. And we refuse to open our heart to love. We refuse to open our heart to allow love in and we refuse to open our heart to love others. And because God's language of communication is love, it's impossible for us to have a relationship with God.
So what we'll do after the break is we'll talk more about prayer and the power of it and what it does to your soul and how it opens your soul. So I would call the next section of what I would want to discuss with you the science of prayer. Does that sound all right? So we'll talk about that after the break. Thanks, guys. <laughs> 